And what is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises that people should be doing, but they're not? Okay, so, so that people should be doing, but they're not. So it's stuff that's exotic. Well, I'll start with the pullover. I I have never once seen someone do a pullover in a commercial gym. Not once. Never, never once. One time I saw a girl set up on a bench with a dumbbell and I was like, she's going to do pullovers. So I was excited. And then she was, she did some like glute thrust with the dumbbell on her hips. So I was like very disappointed afterwards. But yeah, pullovers. Pullovers done properly when you walk your way through the range of motion. Once you start to load, you will see amazing results in your lats, in your thoracic extension, in your shoulder health, in your long head of the tricep, in your chest. It's really is the most underrated compound movement of all time that has been completely taken out of programs for some reason. And I think that the reason is one that people have started to say that it's a bad exercise using dubious reasons at best. Usually people who have never trained pullovers, which usually is not a good sign considering that they have never had the experience of the lift. Uh, it might also be because it's true that when you get into pullovers at the start, they can feel awkward, your neck might cramp, you don't have the range of motion, so you don't feel your lats, and that discourages people. But this is one of those lifts where if you put in the time, it is going to reward you. So that's my number one. Second exercise that I think is underrated, I would pick a forearm exercise, but not any forearm exercise. I would pick a pronation twist. So if you look at most people who train forearms, they're going to do it in the same axis of movement while their wrist remains static. So an armor curl, for example. Okay. That is perfectly fine. It's a great exercise. But they fail to take into account that the forearm and the musculature of the forearm also responds positively to wrist movements. So stuff like actively pronating into a movement. So you do this as you go up or supinating into a movement. The supination is something that people train because a lot of the time, you you end up finding out that you're stronger on the negative when you supinate your arm. So it, it happens by default. But the other way around, I rarely see people who do this. And that's a shame because it's very easy to set up. You just grab, not necessarily a dumbbell, but a loop. You can put around your hand like this, and you tie it to a weight that dangle here, and you're going to do your curls in that fashion. And this pronation is really going to blow up your forearm. The reason why, when you look at arm wrestlers, the majority of them, even the natural ones, tend to have incredible form measurements, sometimes even bigger than their upper arm, is because their wrist is always moving, because that's part of their sport. You can replicate that as a bodybuilder. You don't actually have to arm wrestle. So that's another thing that I would say more people need to do, if only for the sensation. It really actually feels tremendous on the forearm. I've never done it, so I'll, I'll do that. You should give it a try. And you can do it on cables, you can do it with a, a pin stack where you just put plates. It's extremely versatile, even if you have a home gym. Number three. Number three, I would pick something that I've started doing recently for calves. For a long, long time, I was only training my calves through weightlifting exercises, so calf raises, which is absolutely fine, and you all grow from this. But I've always felt that I was lacking in volume. Because when I looked at the total amount of reps I was getting, I was getting 40 to 50 reps per session. And when you think about it, your calves get thousands, tens of thousands of reps every day because you walk on them. Let's say you do 10K steps a day, 10K steps compared to 50 reps. Even if you load the 50 reps, the total amount of volume is not, the discrepancy is not enough. So I was trying to figure out a way to get a lot of steps in while being very intense at the same time. And this is when I started doing something on the Stairmasters. So the Stairmasters in the gym is a great tool for cardio, but it's also a great tool for calves. What I do is I take a backpack and I put kettlebells in the backpack. I'm right now using 55-pound kettlebell, kettlebells. I go onto the Stairmaster with my backpack and I do 10 minutes at a moderately fast pace, not super fast, and I do them on my tippy toes. Okay. So I'm only allowed to put my foot on the last end of the stair and that is horribly intense i've never felt a sensation like that in my calves before from calf raises and two it's a lot of volume because when i look at the end of the 10 minutes usually i've went up 25 to 30 flights of stairs because the stair master counts how many flights you go up to so that's a lot of reps and that has been the key i was missing for my calf growth 
because I'm really starting to see great results from doing both. And I insist on both. You can't just do one. You have to have this plus the heavy response training. And that seems to really unlock an hypertrophy response. And for people who are interested, start with one time a week. And then you can go up to two times a week. It's horribly hard. I'll be honest. It's not something you're going to look forward to, but it does work. And then fourth, so we've done forms, we've done calves, we've done pullovers. I would say neck. I've also never seen people train neck in a commercial gym. Uh, it's been ridiculed for a very long time, which is a shame because it's one of the muscles that makes you the most aesthetic. People see your neck because they look at your face. Mm -hmm. And also, it might be the difference between life and death. Recently, I had a subscriber send me a message telling me, hey, a year and a half ago, I cut the video you made on neck training where I told people, train your neck because it might save your life. And the guy got into a car accident recently and he got T-boned. And once he went to the hospital, the doctor told him, wow, you have nothing. You don't even have contusions in your neck. Usually people snap their vertebra from something like this because of the force of the car slamming into you from the side. The guy was fine. So of course it could just be chance or luck, but the dude told me, hey, I had been training neck for a year and a half and I'm 100% certain that this really helped. So to me, if you're not training neck, you should start, absolutely. I want to see a title, Natural Hypertrophy, Saving Lives, Science-Based. <laughs> 200,000 views in a day. <laughs> um, that's awesome. And with the calves too, like I found that, you know, a lot of uh, people who do hypertrophy have trouble developing the calves. I haven't had that problem. And I think it's because I play a lot of tennis and basketball and sports where you're always running, stopping, going on your tippy toes, jumping. So I think you do need that kind of more endurance uh, component as well. Yeah, it'll also get bros to do some cardio. If we can get some bros to do go on a hike once in a while, that is also going to even 